Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to discuss the definite integral. So we're going to learn how the definite integral comes from the limit of Riemann sums, how to find areas under the curve using definite integrals, how to estimate the value of a definite integral using what's called the midpoint rule, and then in the next video, we'll talk about properties of definite integrals that we can use to find the area under a curve bounded by the x-axis. So let's review a little bit from the last video when we talked about the area problem and the limit of Riemann sums. So in the previous section, we saw the limit of this form where you had the limit as n approaches infinity. So n was representing how many sub intervals we had. We had a sum from i equals one to n. So we were adding up areas of approximation rectangles where the c sub i were sample points. So they could be the left end point, the right end point, the midpoint or any x value in that sub interval. You find out the y value, which is the height of the rectangle, times delta x, which is the width of each rectangle. And then that definitely represents the sum. So this arises because we want to compute the area under the curve, bounded by the x-axis and the curve, between x equals a and x equals b. We also saw that this came from finding the distance traveled by an object, because it was exactly the same problem. In this section, we're going to define what's called the definite integral. So we're going to start integral calculus, and we're going to determine the area under a curve bounded by the x-axis and understand what the properties of definite integrals are. So let's start with the definition of a definite integral. The definite integral is for a function defined on a closed interval, a less than or equal to x, less than or equal to b. So then we're going to take the closed interval, divide it up into n sub intervals or n rectangles they all have the same width delta x is b minus a divided by n and then we have these x values x sub 0 x sub 1 x sub 2 all the way up to x sub n the x sub 0 is the left end point x sub n is the right end point these x values are the end points of each sub interval and then we choose c1 c2 through cn which are the sample points that we talked about in the previous video the c sub i's lie in the i-th subinterval, x sub i minus 1 to x sub i. And then we have what's called the definite integral of f of x from x equals a to x equals b. So that is a lot to say, but the definition of a definite integral is the integral sign is an elongated s. And it comes from um, you're adding the sums of approximation rectangles. You have this a as a subscript. This is called the lower limit of integration. You have a b as a superscript on the integral sign. That's called the upper limit of integration. The function that we are trying to find the area under is called f of x, or the integrand. And then we have this dx. That's the differential dx that represents the variable of integration. It is equal to the limit of the Riemann sum that we were talking about in the previous video. So this limit exists, that means your function is integrable. You can find the area under the curve from x equals a to x equals b bounded by the curve and the x-axis. So then just the note, the integral sign was introduced by Leibniz, so he was one of the founders of calculus. He called this the integral sign, and it's an elongated s, and it's coming from the integral is a limit of sums. So just some of the terminology, remember f of x is called the integrand. The a and the b are the lower limit and the upper limit of integration or limits of integration. And a is the lower limit and b is the upper limit, again. So just introducing some of the notation, we have the integral sign, which is an elongated s. The a is the lower limit of integration b is the upper limit of integration, f of x is called the integrand, dx represents the variable of integration is x, and this dx is the differential, and you would read this as the integral from x equals a to x equals b of f of x with respect to x. So again, the symbol dx tells you that the independent variable is x, so these limits of integration are assumed to be x equals a and x equals b because the variable 
of integration is x. And the process of finding the area under the curve is called integration. So that's a lot of definitions, but it turns out that you do not need to use x as the independent variable always. You could be finding the integral where the variable integration is t representing time, or you can have the variable be any arbitrary variable or letter. The value of the definite integral of the function over an interval, particular interval, depends on the function, not on the letter that we choose for the independent variable. So I could choose t, u, x. I could use p if I want. So integral from a to b, f of t dt, is the same value as integral from a to b, f of u du, which is the same as integral from a to b, f of x dx. They're all the same value. It does not matter what letter you use for the variable of integration. So the variable is called a dummy variable because it does not indicate any relationship at all. And so it represents all real numbers on a closed interval a to b. Now, what does the definite integral represent? It is interpreted as the net area under the curve f of x from x equals a to x equals b. If the function is taking on both positive and negative values, your area will lie above and also below the x-axis. So here's how to interpret net area. If the area is above the x-axis, then that is considered a positive area. If the area is below the x-axis, think of this in terms of what would be the area of each rectangle if we use approximation rectangles. The width would be positive for the width of these rectangles, but their height would be negative values of y. So we're going to consider these values negative. So if you are using approximation rectangles, you'll have positive or negative area. So if you, again, are above the x-axis, this is positive. Positive value. And if you're below the x-axis, then this is considered negative values. Okay, so if it's positive values or negative values, those are referring to the value of the definite integral. So if the positive values are considered a sub 1, and the negative values are considered capital A sub 2, the definite integral from a to b, f of x dx, is a sub 1. It's the area of the region above the x-axis, but still bounded by the curve f of x. So that is a sub 1, and then you subtract the area below the x-axis, but still bounded by the curve f of x. So you take a sub 1 and you subtract a sub 2. So you add these areas together, and then you subtract the area that's below the x-axis. Not every function defined on a closed interval is integrable, as it turns out. There are some conditions that we need for a function to have a area that can be found that's bounded by the curve and the x-axis between two vertical lines, x equals a and x equals b. However, there is a theorem that involves a relationship between continuity and integration, as we're going to see. So the theorem states this. If f of x is a continuous function on a closed interval, so that's a very nice function, continuous, or this condition, if f of x has a finite number of jump discontinuities, so that means you can count the number of jumps that the graph has in the function, then the function is integrable on that closed interval. In other words, the definite integral exists. And how do you find that? Well, you use Riemann sums and the definite integral. So if the function is integrable on the closed interval a to b, then you can find its area. So it's the definite integral a to b f of x dx is the limit of the Riemann sum. So you let the number of rectangles approach infinity. 
of the sum of these approximation area rectangles. I equals 1 to n, so you divide the interval up into n subintervals or n rectangles, and the area is f of x of i delta x. Delta x we found from the previous video, it's the length of the interval, b minus a, and divide up into n rectangles, so divide by n, and this x of i is the left endpoint plus some increment of how many delta x's we have. So let's try example one. We're going to change this limit of a Riemann sum into the notation using definite integrals. So express the limit of the following Riemann sum as an integral on the closed interval zero to pi. So we're going to take this Riemann sum, write it as a definite integral, and the interval is zero to pi. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity, in sum from i equals one to n, and the expression that we're adding for the areas are x of i cubed plus x of i times sine of x of i times the width of each rectangle or subinterval is delta x. So if you compare the limit of the Riemann sum, which is what's given, to the previous theorem, then we need to find out what the function is. So f of x is the integrand for the definite integral. It looks like it's some x value that's being cubed, so x cubed, plus some x value times sine of some x value. So there's the function, x cubed plus x times sine of x. The closed interval we need, it looks like it is zero to pi. That's given in the problem. So a equals zero. This is the lower limit of integration. And b is the upper limit, which is pi. So therefore, we can change this limit of a Riemann sum, so limit as n approaches infinity, of the sum i equals one to n x sub i cubed plus x sub i sine x sub i times delta x is, so we can change this limit of a Riemann sum to a definite integral where the lower limit was zero, the upper limit is pi, and then the integrand is x cubed plus x sine of x. Make sure that goes in parentheses for the whole integrand. And then do not forget to represent what is the variable of integration. So that tells you what the zero and the pi, what are those values? Those are x values. So this is how you would rewrite this limit of a Riemann sum into a definite integral. So a couple other things before we get to example two. If the function is non-negative, so the function is above the x-axis, it is integrable, so you can find the area on a closed interval. Sometimes the graph of the function that you're trying to find the area under forms a simple geometric figure. Rectangles, triangles, trapezoids, or even circles or semicircles. So we can use known geometric formulas to find the area under the curve. So that's what we're gonna do in example two. Use geometry to evaluate integrals sketch the region corresponding to each definite integral, and then evaluate each integral using a simple geometric formula. So number one, we're going to find the integral from two to five of three dx. So notice that the integrand is three, so that's the function, y equals three, or f of x equals three, and the closed interval is two comma five. So this function is integrable because it's continuous and it's a closed interval two comma five. Let's graph the function so we can identify what does the shape produce that we're trying to find the area of. So the function y equals three is a horizontal line that crosses the y-axis at three. 
Okay, so then we're trying to find the area under the curve, or bounded by the curve, and the x-axis, where the area begins at x equals 2. So there's the line x equals 2. And we're going up to x equals 5, which would be here. And it's the area that's below the curve, bounded by the x-axis. So it's this region. So if you draw the area correctly, or your graph accurately, with evenly spaced tick marks, this will turn out to be a square. So we can find out the length and the width, so we can find out the area of this square or rectangle. If it was a rectangle, we could do the same thing. It's length times width. So the area is length. The length that would be from x equals 2 to x equals 5, so the length is 3. And the height, or the width, is also 3, because the y value is 3. So the area of this shape is 9, which represents the area under the curve, y equals 3, from x equals 2 to x equals 5. So let's try several more. So number 2. So we found out that the last graph gave us a rectangle, or a square. This time we're going to look at what is the area under the curve, so the definite integral from 0 to 3, where the function is x subtract 3, and then the variable integration is x, so dx. So identify the function. It is a linear function this time, x subtract 3, and the closed interval is 0 to 3. So notice that the function is again continuous on the closed interval, so it is integrable. So let's identify what the graph looks like. Just make a quick sketch so you can identify what the area that you're trying to find represents. So x attract 3. Let's try to find out what the y values would be at the endpoints. So f of 0 would be negative 3, and f of 3 would be 0. So at x equals 0, the y value is negative 3. So this is where the area would begin at x equals 0. And it goes until x equals 3, which is right on the x-axis. So this is an x-intercept that we found. This is the y-intercept. And we know that the linear function has a slope of 1, so the graph would pass through just these two points are needed. And this is the graph of f of x equals x attract 3. So the area that we're trying to find is this region bounded by the x-axis and the curve, or in this case is the line, between x equals 0 and x equals 3. So you'll notice that it's a triangle this time. And area of a triangle has a formula, 1 half times base times height. So 1 half times the base, one base of this triangle would be 1, 2, 3 base. And the height would also be 3. So we've come up with an area that is 9 divided by 2. But, notice that the area that's being represented by this definite integral is below the x-axis. So, instead of positive 9 halves, this definite integral would, re would give us negative 9 halves. This area is below the x-axis. So, the area takes on negative values. for the definite integral. Alright, let's try a third problem, number three. So, so far we've had a rectangle or a square and now a triangle. Let's find out the value from x equals 1 to x equals 2 of the function 3x plus 2 and the variable of integration is dx. So this time the function is still a linear function, 3x plus 2, and we still have a closed interval, 
This time will be x equals 1 to x equals 2. And again, this is a linear function, so it's continuous. So integrable on a closed interval. So let's again make a sketch of the graph to identify what the shape would be. So let's find out what the y values would be at the endpoints again. So f of 1 is um, 5, f of 2 would be 8. So we're finding out the endpoints because we know that this is a linear function and if we identify just two points we know the graph. So at x equals 1 the y value is 5. And at x equals 2, the y value is 8. So we're only trying to find the area from x equals 1 to x equals 2, but this is what the graph looks like for f of x, um, 3x plus 2. But this time we are bounded by the lines x equals 1 and the line x equals 2. So we're trying to find the area between these two vertical lines and the x-axis and the curve. So we have this shape, which is a trapezoid. Or you can divide it up into a rectangle and a triangle if you wish. We're going to do a trapezoid this time. So remember that the area of a trapezoid is one half times one base plus the other base of the trapezoid, add those together times a half, and then multiply by the height of the trapezoid. So you have one base that is the length of this side, so that would be uh, 5 because that was determined by the point. So we have a equals 1 half times 5 plus the other base, which would be this length, which is 8 because that's the y value at at x equals 2 times the height which is 1 because we're going from x equals 1 to x equals 2. So notice that this becomes 13 halves as the area of the trapezoid and it's positive because it's above the x-axis. So we get 13 divided by 2 for the area of this definite integral. You would find out that the area is the same if you found out the area of this rectangle, and found out the area of the triangle separately, and added the two areas together. All right, one more. So we've had rectangles, squares, triangles, and now trapezoids. Let's find the area from 0 to 2, where the function this time is square root, 4 subtract x squared, and the variable integration is x. So this time the function is a radical function, square root 4 minus x squared, and again, we are on the closed interval, 0 to 2. So this function is not defined for all x values. Notice that the domain is from negative 2 to 2. Well, the function is defined on 0 to 2, and it's also continuous. So it is integrable. So let's find out what the shape of this graph would be by making a quick sketch. Uh, positive square root 4 minus x squared, we're going to get the upper half of a circle. If it was negative square root 4 minus x squared, we'll get the lower half, the lower semicircle. So this will be a circle of radius 2, but only the upper half of the circle. So it will go between x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2 for the, the entire graph. So this is f of x equals square root 4 minus x squared. Now, we're not interested in the entire area, though, because that would be integral from negative 2 to x equals 2. We're just going from 0 to 2. So it's just the area that's in the first quadrant. So notice that this becomes 1 fourth of the entire circle of radius 2. So we need the area of a circle this time, which is a equals pi times radius squared, or just pi r squared. But since we're only needing a fourth of the circle, we'll find out the area and then divide by 4. 
So notice that the radius of this semicircle is 2. So a equals pi times 2 squared, which is 4 pi. That's the entire circle. So the area here is 4 pi divided by 4, or just pi. So the definite integral from x equals 0 to x equals 2 of our function is pi. Okay, one more thing we're going to finish up with in this first video. It's called the midpoint rule. So oftentimes, you can choose sample points to be the left endpoint or the right endpoint of your ith subinterval. Most people use the right endpoint. But it turns out that you can also find an approximation, as we found out in the previous video, if you choose sample points to be the midpoint of each interval. And it turns out that these are better approximations than either the left endpoint or the right endpoint. So we will denote these by x sub i bar. That means average. So it's the average of the two endpoints of your subinterval is the midpoint to give you the sample point. So this is called the midpoint rule. You can approximate the area from x equals a to x equals b of the function f of x, where the variable of integration is x, is approximately the sum, i equals 1 to n, f of x sub i bar delta x, which is the sum of all the y values determined by the midpoint, x sub i bar, times the width of each rectangle. So delta x is b minus a divided by n. If you have n subintervals or n rectangles, and x of i bar is the average of the two endpoints of your subinterval. So any Riemann sum is an approximation of an integral. If we use midpoints, you do in fact get better approximations than using the left or the right endpoint. So we're going to find that out in the third example using what's called the midpoint rule. So example three, estimating an integral used using the midpoint rule. Use the midpoint rule with n equals five subintervals to approximate the area that's illustrated in the figure below. So notice in the figure that the function is y equals one divided by x. So it's the rational function, but we're only considering this from, looks like the area begins at x equals one and ends at x equals two. So this closed interval is one to two. So 1 over x is not continuous for all x values because you cannot substitute in x equals 0, but it is continuous on the closed interval from 1 to 2. So f of x is integrable on that interval. So let's find out the width of each of these rectangles if we are using five subintervals. So delta x is b subtract a divided by n, which would be 2 minus 1 divided by 5 or one-fifth. So each subinterval will be a width of one-fifth, or 0.2. The sample points this time are midpoints. So let's make a number line, just like we did in the previous video, where we identify what are the midpoints. So we're starting at x equals 1, we're going up to x equals 2, we are dividing this interval into five equal width subintervals. So one, two, three, four, five. We are using the um, midpoints of each subinterval. So that's what these x values or these x's are representing. So if I divide this up into equal widths, this would be six fifths, seven fifths, eight fifths. 9 fifths, and then 10 fifths would be 2. So we're identifying what the endpoints would be for each subinterval first. And now you need to find the average of the two endpoints to find the midpoint of each subinterval. So that would give you 11 tenths, 13 tenths, 15 tenths, 17 tenths, and then 19 tenths. If you change those to decimals, it's fine as well. So the midpoint rule. states that the integral from x equals 1 to x equals 2 of our function 1 divided by x dx is approximately the sum from i equals 1 to 5, because we're using 5 subintervals, f of x sub i bar 
times delta x, which would be delta x times the sum of the y values determined by the midpoints. So we have f of 11 tenths plus f of 13 tenths plus f of 15 tenths and then so forth until the last midpoint, 19 tenths. And we also know that delta x is 1 fifth. So this is equal to 1 fifth times. Now we can find the y values. So this function is not that difficult to substitute in the x's to find the y values. It's just going to be the reciprocal. So 10 elevenths plus 10 thirteenths plus 10 fifteenths, 10 seventeenths, and then finally 10 nineteenths. And this is approximately equal to 0 0.691908. So that gives us an approximation, which is a very good approximation for the area that's under the curve or bounded by the curve f of x equals 1 over x between x equals 1, x equals 2, and the x-axis. So this would be a good place to stop. So if you have any questions regarding the midpoint rule or finding the area using simple geometric formulas or how the definite integral relates back to the limit of Riemann sums, please let me know. If you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about properties of definite integrals.